the last but one video, I said that carbon formed more compounds than all the other elements put together. Obviously, you are aware there are quite a number of functional groups that you have to learn. There are a lot more out there. Trust me, if you do any advanced chemistry and go to university, you'll meet a lot more. But even more than that is the fact that carbon doesn't have to form straight chains. So, for example, if we had something like butane, and I'm just going to show the carbon skeleton to make it easier to see rather than put the hydrogens in. Hydrogens, just three there, two there, two there, and three there. Easy. But that four carbon chain could also be written like that. You still have a viable carbon compound where each carbon will have four bonds to it. You'd fill up with hydrogens again like you did in the first one. Now this is butane. And this is methylpropane. There will be no alternatives for just three carbons. You need to get to four before you can do this. And we call these isomers. Isomers are basically compounds with the same molecular formula. Both of these would be C4H10, but a different structure. So with four carbons, there are two possibilities. With five carbons, there are three possibilities. And clearly, as the number of carbons go up, so there are more and more possibilities. I think I'm right in saying that if you go to 10 carbons, decane, there are 75 possible structures. Try and write them all. There is actually a website out there where some guy has written the structures up to about C14. And I think we're going into the thousands when you get up there. And he's written all the structures and named them. Clearly, too much time on his hands. Isomers will be found in all of the different types of functional groups, the alkenes, the alkynes, the haloalkanes, the alcohols, and so on and so on. We mentioned some of them. We said you could have like butan-1-ol, butan-2-ol. All right, those would be isomers. Um, you will also get aldehydes can have isomeric ketones. Carboxylic acids can have isomeric esters. So there's a lot of them. Again, there'll be lots of practice given to you in the booklet. Now, these are all structural isomers. However, there is another kind of isomerism that you need to be aware of, and that is called stereoisomerism. That will only occur where a bond cannot move. So let's say, for argument's sake, I had an alkene double bond. And let's say I had, say, a CH3 there, an H there, and a CH3 there, and an H there. Now what I've just drawn is but2-ene. Maybe it looks a bit different to when it's drawn in a straight line, but hopefully you can see that. So this is but2-ene. Now because the double bond holds those two carbons rigidly, you can't twist a double bond. Single bonds, you can twist them. But double bonds hold the molecule very, very rigidly in place. So that means if I do this and put a CH3 and an H, well, the same as this one, and then change these two around, I've actually got two different structures. That double bond prevents me twisting and turning that into that. So this is a form of isomerism called geometrical isomerism. It's stereoisomerism where you have the same molecular formula, C4H8, the same structure because each carbon has the same atoms or groups attached to it, but a different arrangement in space. This is called geometric isomerism. And to distinguish the two butenes, now they both but to ene. This is called the cis isomer because the two methyl groups or the two hydrogens are on the same side of the double bond. And this is called the trans isomer where the methyl groups or the hydrogens are on opposite sides of the double bond. So cis butuene, trans butuene geometrical isomers. 
The final thing for this first part of the unit, which is essentially basic organic chemistry, is some revision stuff that you did back in chemical bonding days, which is probably last year. This was unit two. And that is to be aware of the intermolecular forces that can affect things like boiling point and solubility. So let's take three examples. Let's take an alkane, like say propane, CH3, CH2, CH3. Let's take a haloalkane, like CH3, CH2, CH2Cl. So that's one chloropropane. And then let's take an alcohol, CH3, CH2, CH2OH, and that would be propan-1-ol, or 1-propanol. Now, these three will all have different boiling points and different solubilities. For example, propane is an alkane. There are no permanent dipoles present. Now, if you can't remember what those are, a dipole is where two atoms joined together have different electronegativities, such that one of them has more of the attraction for the electrons and ends up as slightly negative, and the other one obviously then becomes slightly positive. Alkanes have no polarity. As such, the only forces that can hold them together are weak dispersion forces. Some books will call them van der Waals forces. They arise because of the movement of electrons creating these temporary dipoles. They are the weakest of the intermolecular forces. So these alkanes are very low melting and boiling. In fact, propane is a gas at room temperature, which you knew because you put it in your barbecue every time you have a barbecue. The haloalkane has a carbon chlorine bond. Therefore, it has a permanent dipole. Therefore, it will have stronger attractions between its molecules than propane. Also, the fact that the chlorine makes it a bigger molecule as well. It's heavier. So effectively, this will have greater attractions. But if I had an alkane of similar mass to this, then the chloro compound would still, still have the higher boiling point because the dipole would have a greater attraction for its neighbors than would no dipole. The alcohol would have the highest boiling point of them all. And that's because the alcohol has an OH group. And this means it can form hydrogen bonds with its neighbors. Now, hydrogen bonds are the strongest of the intermolecular attractions. And that is why propanol, even methanol, is a liquid at room temperature. The first five alkanes are gases at room temperature. Pentane just becomes a liquid. But methane, ethane, propane and butane are all gases at room temperature, whereas methanol is a liquid, the very first alcohol. These, again, become liquids before those do. Solubility. We're talking about solubility probably in water. If we're in water, you need to remember the rule like dissolves like. This is non-polar, water is polar. Therefore, alkanes do not dissolve in water. If I add some petrol, which is effectively an isomer of octane, if I add that to water, it floats on the top. And I can shake it till my arm aches, and it will not mix with water. The haloalkane is polar, but not that polar. So it probably also would not dissolve very well in water. But the alcohol will dissolve freely. Methanol and ethanol are very soluble in water. However, as we go up the family and go to the higher carbon chains, butanol, pentanol, hexanol, you find the solubility decreases and eventually they become virtually insoluble. And that's because that single little OH group, which is trying to hydrogen bond to the water, is fighting against this hydrocarbon chain, which hates water. So you have a bit of a competition when there's an OH and just one or two carbons, the OH wins. But once the OH is fighting against a half a dozen or more carbons, the carbons win. So those are the physical properties of the organics that you need to be familiar with. Boiling point, solubility. Polars have high solubility, high boiling. Non-polars, low solubility, low boiling.